Hey, good day, it's Prezo, thanks for stopping by. Now, I've got a short little video today on making some tooling for your milling machine if you own one. And uh, I've got a new sticker, we're going to get that one up on the door. And we'll talk about the owner. And then we're going to go over the bench and I'm going to show you my balls. Now, today's sticker comes all the way from the USA, it belongs to Mick, and his channel is called Mick's Workshop. I'll put a link in the description below. Some people said that when I mentioned these stickers and their owners, they had trouble finding the channels on YouTube. So I'll put the link below there. And uh, Mick has over 63 videos on his channel at present. He owns a beautiful Clausing 100 lathe, does a lot of uh, general shop and machining stuff, and uh, also into Touch DRO, which is uh, one of my favorite things too. So uh, check out Mick's channel. I'll get his uh, sticker up here now. I think we're gonna have to go a little bit lower on the door, but uh, we'll get that one on there now. Alrighty, I think we'll put uh, Mick here underneath Alberto. There it is. Alright, check out Mick's workshop. Now, just before I do show you my balls, I thought I'd show you this. Now, this parcel arrived last week and it comes all the way from the Netherlands and it belonged to Bart Hakima. Now, he's got a channel on YouTube. I'll put a link in the description below. But he also posts a lot of his stuff now on Instagram. Again, there's the link there. And uh, he posted a picture a while ago, or a video in fact, of a Lister cabinet in his workshop which he had absolutely full of end mills and slot drills. And I mean full, it was huge. So here's a, here's a short clip of what I saw. And uh, I made one of those sort of throwaway comments and I said, uh, if I break an end mill in my shop, that's sort of the end of my machining for a week. Now that's not quite true, but certainly I don't have anywhere near the number of brand new sharp end mills or slot drills that he has. And you know, after making that comment, I sort of forgot about it. And then this arrived, and uh, this is just a selection. Now he said he wanted to send more, uh, like the bigger ones, but uh, he said he was up to the weight limit on the, the parcel when he sent it. But this is, this is like a lifetime supply for me. <laughs> this will see me out. And these are all carbide, these are all high speed steel, but they're all brand new, they're all sharp, and they're really useful sizes. So I uh, truly appreciate Bart sending these. Uh, it was totally unexpected, but it's gonna, it's gonna bulk out my supply no end. <laughs> so uh, yeah, thanks very much, Bart. Now, speaking of unexpected gifts, now this arrived to me last week and it was given to me by my sister, but it actually belonged to my uncle. Now my uncle Len uh, was a medical doctor. He lived in Melbourne most of his life. And he was a keen collector of tools and equipment and uh, engines. And this is a Stuart Turner 10H. Now the H is for horizontal and it's a steam engine. Complete kit, unopened. And it also came with a set of instructions. So there's all of the information on how to build it and the parts drawings and so on. And apparently Len bought this uh, back in 1986 and there's the original uh, receipt for it. So he paid a total of $91.52 and that included the kit and a book. Now I won't do a YouTube series on this because it just takes too long. Uh, people get bored with it after a while. I'll probably post some stuff on my Instagram as I do this. And I have actually built the Stuart Turner number no. 8 engine which is slightly bigger than this one. Similar configuration. So I sort of, I've already done one like this. and. Uh, yeah, uh, it's going to be a lovely little kit, but wait, there's more. Now this also came from my Uncle Len. This is a complete set of castings for an 060 three and a half inch gauge steam locomotive called Rob Roy. Now it was designed by Martin Evans. There's the book that came with it. And Martin Evans was a prolific writer and uh, designer of steam locomotives. Now most of his work was in the British Model Engineer magazine. And in fact, I built uh, his design for an 040 tank locomotive called Conway. Now I've got that sitting upstairs, it's a runner. I've uh, run it on my track here at home. Beautiful locomotive. But uh, the Rob Roy is uh, a tank locomotive, but it has tanks on either side of the boiler. And these are a little bit quicker and simpler to build because you don't have to build a tender. And uh, that means less machining of frames and wheels and axles and so on. Now, am I going to build this? Uh, yeah, probably. <laughs> I won't be able to leave it alone. But yeah, uh, lovely set of castings and just everything you need is there. Well, all of the, the castings anyway. 
Now one of the reasons I'm showing you this is that these castings are all unmachined. They don't have any flat surfaces or bores or anything like that as a reference. And when you machine a casting like this, you've got to pick a surface and then machine that first and that becomes your reference for everything else. So in this case, I probably machine that port face first and then that gets pushed up against the fixed jaw in your vise. And the problem with this is that when you go to press it up against the fixed jaw, the moving jaw comes in and will touch these two flanges. Well, actually it doesn't. It will probably only touch one of them. And just say this one here is a little bit higher than this one. When you close the vise, it tends to influence the part and move it. So it would be better if you could actually clamp in the middle here in this hollow section. And that would mean putting a piece of copper bar stock in there or something like that. Now there is a better way or at least another way. And uh, one of the reasons I'm wearing my Joe Pye shirt today is that I had seen him do a casting for a model of a, what was it, a milling machine. And he used a spherical ball to put pressure on the casting to keep the pressure uh, sort of evenly distributed over the face that touches the fixed jaw. And uh, that's why I said I want to show you my balls, so let's have a look. And there they are. Now, yeah, I wish they were bigger, but you know, you've got to take what you can get. And there are three different sizes in here though. There's 16, 18 and 20 millimeter diameter balls. You can buy them in Imperial, and I got these on eBay. And I think I paid about $20, including shipping, for all 15 of these. There's five of each size. Now they are fully hardened, I checked them with a file and they're you know, super hard. Now just as they are, they're not much use as a work holding device. What you need to do is to grind a flat on the ball and that allows you to put that flat surface up against the face of the moving jaw and it stops the ball rolling around as you're trying to tighten it in the vise. And today's video is three different ways you can produce that flat surface on a hardened steel ball. So let's have a look at the first method. Now here is one I prepared earlier. So this is a 20 millimeter hardened steel ball and as you can see it's got a flat grind on one side. In fact it's not completely flat but the diameter of that flat there is around about 12 millimeters diameter. The actual diameter is not that important. Now if you own a deeper grinder it's fairly straightforward on this machine. If you own a surface grinder you could do the same thing but you would need some sort of a spin indexer if you want a dead flat grind, a uh, surface grinder would do it quite easily. Now, the thing with this surface here is that it is very slightly concave. And that means when you seat the ball against the moving jaw of the vise, it's only making contact with the very outer edge of that circular face there. And that ensures that it does actually sit flat without rocking. So in the spindle of the machine here, I've got a 5C collet set up. It's a 20 millimeter 5C collet. And it's a good idea if you're going to do this to get a magnet to allow you to hold the ball while you put it into the collet. So I'm going to push that in about halfway and tighten the collet. Don't need to really tighten it that much. And I've got the latch here set so it's locked the spindle. And what you can do now is move that latch all the way to the front and that allows the ball and the spindle to rotate freely. Now at the same time I've set the face of the collet dead parallel with the surface of the stone. This is a cup wheel here and I've got the axis of the, the rotating spindle set round to about 10 degrees. And what we're going to do now is push the face of the ball in against the very edge of the cup wheel and we're going to start grinding at that point. So what we'll do now is move the whole work head assembly in until the ball bearing is just clear of the edge of the cup wheel. So around about there. And I'll just rotate the wheel and make sure we're clear. And what we want to do is to then start the machine up and we'll start to advance the, the cup wheel toward the ball bearing or if you like, you can use the control down at the bottom bar and move the whole work head assembly toward the wheel. It doesn't really matter which way you go. And uh, because of the 10 degree angle that I've got with the offset on the work head, it will grind a slightly concave surface. Now, if I didn't rotate the ball and just move the ball toward the cup wheel, it would carve out a sort of a, like a curved scallop, I guess, because of the geometry of the edge of that wheel. But because we're gonna be rotating the ball bearing at the same time, it will translate that, that scallop around into a sort of a dished surface, a concave surface. So uh, let's start up and uh, we'll start grinding and then as we go along we'll, we'll check it and we'll make sure we're actually grinding right to the very centre of the ball. Alright, 
Now I can't really see what I'm doing here. <laughs> I can't, can't look around without getting my head in the way of the camera. Uh, let me just check. Uh, I'm going to turn this off for a second check. Alrighty, I stuck my head in there and had a look and it seems okay. So we're going to keep going and remember we want a flat around about 12 millimeters for a 20 millimeter diameter ball. Okay, it's going pretty good. I did notice there was a bit of wobble in my work head. I didn't have it locked up completely tight, but I fixed that. And we're getting close. Uh, we'll go a little bit further, and then we're going to take the ball out and check to see whether we got that concave in the center of the grind. Okay, it's looking pretty good. I'm going to take that out now and we'll check it. If it's not right, if you want to go further, you can put it back in again. you just got to be a little bit careful to align that flat. Well, there it is. It's a bit hot. <laughs> but uh, that grinding process leaves a really lovely texture on that face there. So what I'll do is I'm going to blue this up and then we'll rub it on something. We'll just check to see if we have contact at the very outer edge there. I've just uh, put some blue Sharpie on that surface there. And this is a precision ground flat stone. So I'm just going to rub that on the surface of the stone. And don't know if you can see that, but there's a little bright ring all the way around the outside edge there. Let me just do that a bit more. So I think you see it more clearly there now. So we do actually have a hollow grind on that face there, and that's what we're looking for. And then you're probably saying to yourself, but Mark, I don't own a D-bit grinder, what am I going to do? Well, if you own a belt grinder, there's another couple of options that you can use. So here's an alternate method if you don't own a D-bit grinder. Now you may own a square collet block and a set of ER collets, and in this case I've just put the 20mm ball in a 20mm ER collet, fastened that down, and then I've just pushed that up against the face of my belt grinder. Now it's not quite as good as the D-bit grinder method because if you're not careful, you could get a slight curvature to that face there. And uh, one way of checking that would be afterwards, just simply rub that surface on an oil stone, have a look at it, and if it's not quite right, you could do a bit of corrective grinding on an oil stone, as long as it's good and flat. Uh, and you could get a dead flat surface, or if you really want to go overboard, you could lap it. <laughs> you could do a full Renzetti, lap it dead flat, and you're done. So um, I'm going to set up another one. This is uh, the 20 millimeter ball. We'll do an 18 millimeter one, and I'll show you how that works. So this is an 18 millimeter ER collet for an 18 millimeter diameter ball, and you want to push that in there just a little bit past halfway. And you don't need to crank this down really hard. In fact, it's not good for the collet anyway because we're only getting a line contact around the inside of the collet. Unlike a, an end mill, for example, we're getting a full cylindrical contact on the inside of the collet. So I think I'm just going to do that sort of hand tight because we're not going to be pressing up terribly hard against the face of the belt anyway. You just simply overheat everything. So this is the setup that I'm using here. I've got a piece of scrap aluminium clamped to the table on my belt grinder and that just gives clearance for the nut on the square collet block. And we want this ground surface of the square collet block rubbing on that aluminium surface there. And I don't have a lot of room there, but I can drop that in and start grinding. You do need to be careful you don't tilt the collet block too much and make contact between the nut and the surface of the belt. And you don't need to be particularly careful about how you align the square collet block. No matter what you do, you'll end up with a circular face and a flat surface as long as you don't start rocking this toward the end of the grinding process. Now I think that's a 60 grit belt. You want something that's fairly free cutting and fairly new, otherwise you'll be there for ages. So let's go ahead and do this one.
And I think that's done. Uh, right toward the end, there are slowed down with the traversing action across the surface of the belt, because if you go too fast, it can influence the, the block, and you may end up with a slightly curved surface. So I'll put this on an oil stone, and we'll just give it a bit of a rub and just see how flat it really is. And you know, like I say, that's the corrective process if you think it's not right. So this is a 1000 grit diamond stone. I'm just going to put a bit of water on that. No, it's not bad. You can see, still see a little bit of the, the grinding marks from the belt, but all in all, it's pretty flat. Let's just give that a bit more. This water has a little bit of detergent in it too, just to wash away any of the debris. I reckon that's flat enough. So if you can get something like that straight off the belt and just give it a light rub on a stone, as long as your stone's flat, you should be pretty good. So you're probably saying, I don't own a square collet block, so what do I do now? Well, you improvise. So this is the super low-tech alternate version number three. All you need is a block of wood, uh, preferably a fairly hard sort of wood, and we're going to just simply mark some diagonals on the end, although even this is not strictly necessary. Just get it roughly in the center and mark a center line that way as well. And we're going to use this to cut a slot later on. Okay, we're going to drill a hole. The hole should be nominal diameter for the size of the ball that you want to make. In this case, going to use 16 millimeters. So I'm using a 16 millimeter spade bit here. Uh, it's actually under 16 by a fraction. Probably better to have the ball too tight in this hole rather than too loose. And we want to drill this fairly deep. So I'm using a spade bit because they cut fast and you can drill deep with them. Now that ball won't fit in there, but I'm going to split this now, I'll do that on the bandsaw and then we'll be able to knock the ball in there and clamp it. So we're going to put our improvised collet block in the vise here and we're going to load the ball into that hole there. Now this hole is slightly undersized, but that's probably a good thing. And what we can do is just push the ball down a little bit more than halfway and we'll clamp that in place. Now none of this has to be super accurate. So that's sort of holding that ball quite tightly now. And this surface here will go on the table of the belt sander and it doesn't need to be accurate. We're just basically holding this and then pushing into the surface of the belt. We'll sweep it backwards and forwards but that's mainly so we don't overheat the belt in one spot. Okay, I think we're going to stop there. These small diameter balls tend to overheat very quickly and you can see that's just starting to go a straw color, which means I'm removing some hardness from the ball. Now that in itself is not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, if they're too hard, there's a, you know, an outside possibility you might shatter it if you were clamping something that was also very hard, but with soft materials in the vise and the big flat surface against the moving jaw of the vise, I don't think that's a problem. But I'll give this one a rub on the diamond stone now, and there you've seen three different ways of doing the same thing, and uh, we'll call it a day. Okay, I got that out, and it was quite hot. <laughs> I 
and you can see it's burned a ring on the inside of that block of wood there. So if you're going to do a lot of these, you might be better off to make a fixture out of uh, metal, aluminium for example. But yeah, for a couple, uh, wood's fine. So I'll just give this a very light rub and I'll show you where I've ground that surface there. And you can see that it's not dead flat off the belt grinder. It's close, but we can make it dead flat now on the stone. All right, I'm going to leave that there. It's not perfect. Uh, one of the problems with these diamond stones is that hexagonal grid pattern in them. As I'm moving the ball over the surface here, I can feel it grabbing in the gaps between the pattern and it's wanting to tip and rattle and so on. But I think for general workshop use, that method is valid. If all you have is a belt grinder, uh, then this method works. If you have a D-bit grinder, I think that's the superior method that gives you that hollow or concave surface on the ball. And uh, if you have uh, like a square collet block, that method works fine too. I think, you know, my feeling is that that block of wood is probably better. Uh, if you t accidentally touch it on the surface of the belt, you're not going to do any really, you know, expensive damage to your tooling. So there you go. Um, let's go and over to the bench now and we'll wind up. So just on the way to the bench, I thought I'd show you this setup here. So uh, this is the cylinder casting from the Rob Roy locomotive. And I'd like you to imagine that I've machined that back face there. Now I haven't, because if I do that, it means I've started the project and uh, <laughs> I don't want to do that yet. Got other things I need to do. But imagine that's machined and then the ball goes in here, tighten the vise. And what it means is you've got this single point of contact and it, uh, it means that there's less chance that the casting is going to tip or skew or roll because we only have this single point. Now just be aware that when I remove that ball there will be a dimple in that surface there because it's only bronze. Now if that's a problem you've got to think of another way of doing it. In this case there will be cleating over that cylinder which is like a steel sheet uh, insulation surface. So all of that will be hidden at a later stage. But yeah that's, that's something you need to think about. In fact I'll take it out and show you. And oh, don't roll away. Uh, can you see that? So it's just there. And I mean, I didn't crank down really hard on that bias either, but that could be a problem if it's a, a finished surface or something that you can't machine at a later stage. But yeah, that's, that's something you need to think about. Anyway, let's go over the bench. Now, one thing I didn't mention before is that this pair of 20 millimeter balls here are not matched for height. If you really wanted that, you could use a backstop in a 5C collet and then use the graduated dials on your deeper grinder and you could probably get these to within say a thou or 0.03 of a millimeter. And then using a micrometer and a diamond hone, you could get it even closer. Now I've left uh, each one of these sizes as a complete spherical ball. And the reason you might want to do that is that you can place it on top of a machinist jack like that and then you've got a single point of contact with a workpiece that might have a curved face or an angular face. So uh, just having that sitting on top of there just gives you another option for work holding in the milling machine. So I have got one of each size that's just left as a perfectly spherical ball. All right, um, let's finish up. Ah, that's it guys. Thanks very much for watching today. I hope you enjoyed taking a look at my balls. Oh, who is that? Is that you? All right, now that's enough of that primary school behavior, okay? Now I'm gonna ask you to leave the doors open. Ah, oh, balls. Ah, oh, come on. I'm never gonna find that thing now.
So these are some king parrots. They're in the macaranga trees just on our fence line. Really pretty birds. The uh, macarangas are out in flower at the moment and they're chewing up the seeds. <laughs> uh, this is what they're feeding on. Doesn't look very appetizing. <laughs> 